This, 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 this is the Apparelist Podcast, designed to bring you real-life conversation about high-level topics relevant to the decorated apparel community. What is up, apparel industry? And welcome to another episode of the Apparelist Podcast. We're here to bring you in-depth conversation on important business topics, covering everything from cybersecurity to sustainability in your shop even taking deep dives into decorating techniques and how to set yourself apart from the competition. Joining us for today's episode is Lee Stewart. He is the owner and founder of Rogue Lab. Recently, some pretty cool news was announced that Ryanette and Riley Hopkins launched a signature series press with Lee's name on it. And you guys, seriously, it is not every day you get a press named after you. So we thought we'd connect directly with Lee to talk about that process and just what his everyday life looks like at Rogue Lab. So, uh, you know, there's a lot to his story. So without further ado, let's uh, all give a warm, a perilous welcome to Lee. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, you originally had reached out to me about this really cool thing. You you have a press named after you. I mean, I, I'm not really sure. I don't know that I know of any other presses out there that have a decorator's name on it. Um, so talk to me a little bit about that. Like, how did it get started? How did, how did you wind up with your name on a press? It's crazy. I still can't believe it's a real thing. I'm the, the first person to, uh, to break this new ground, I guess you could say. It, it's nuts, honestly. It started off a couple of years ago, actually, um, about two years ago now with the, the squeegee. I was a real advocate for the easy grip squeegee when that thing came out um due to my background of riding for a living i, I broke my arms and wrists like crazy and uh, i couldn't pull a squeegee properly but uh, i knew that i needed to pull to to get the print quality that i was looking for so i ended up finding the easy grip was a real big advocate for it and uh we ended up teaming up with them on it and we came up with the signature squeegee first uh, about two years ago. Um, we took that thing, made it black, made it cool, did a little bit of different stuff with it and uh, stuck my name on that thing. And it did really, really well. The feedback was was crazy with how many people ended up switching over to that thing. You know, between myself and Roundnet, getting messages from people like, you know, this thing changed the way I print. This thing changed so much for me. I'm doing so much better now, all this type of stuff. And uh, the more that came in, the more I was like, man, we could we could do something bigger. We could do something better. Uh, we started talking about, you know, what's the next step. And I just started thinking, you know what, like my audience is probably 80% uh, people starting off in the industry or, you know, between beginner to intermediate level. That's kind of the sweet spot that I live in right now. Cause I do a lot of, you know, tutorial type of stuff. And I started thinking, you know, we could probably take one of these presses that exists and retool it, add some new stuff, some cool features and make like the ultimate, startup press for somebody. And Ryonet was like, hell yes, that's an awesome idea. What do you have in mind? I started designing some stuff up with with them and their crew. And yeah, it took about a year and a half for that project to become a real thing. And then once it came out, it was just like, wow, this is, it, it's unbelievable. It's, <laughs> every time I start talking about it, I almost get like lost for words because I still don't believe it's a real thing that my name is on a press that people are using to build businesses with right now. And it's just, it's, Something I'm eternally grateful for. I can tell you that. Oh well, yeah, I mean, again, just like mind blown about all this. And there's so many things about what you were just talking about that really can stick out to me. Um, and the first thing that really sort of jumps out is you're talking about your history, right? You used to ride. Is is it motocross you used to ride? Yeah, I was. I was kind of a like a three, like a triple threat athlete. I guess you could say. I did uh, freestyle motocross, freestyle snowmobiling, and I did the uh, the the stunt bike stuff on street bikes all at the same time. So I was year round uh, riding contests and shows for, I don't know, 12 years, something like nice. that. And, uh, you know, of course, when you're doing dangerous stuff like that, you know, big jumps and tricks and things like that, you, you get hurt pretty often. <laughs> and uh, the largest amount of my injuries were to my arms and shoulders. It made it very difficult to get in the print industry, I can tell you. <laughs> well, yeah, you, you always hear these stories about, you know, pulling a squeegee. I mean, I, I myself have only done it a handful of times. And let me tell you, it's not the easiest thing in the world. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think my expectation going into it was, oh, you're just like pulling this thing across the screen. It's got ink. Like, how hard could it be? Um, but, you know, even without previous injuries, I think, wow, that's actually pretty difficult. So the fact that you were able to like take something and make it easier for someone like you, because we, we all know you're probably not the only person out there who has struggled with something like this, right? Where mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to do, it's physically difficult. So I think that taking your experiencing and helping design something like this is crucial because 
Ryanette does great stuff. You know, all these other guys design great presses, but to have a decorator's touch and influence, I think speaks volumes. Yeah. And I mean, that was, that was just it. So like the Riley 250 was the press that we based it off of. Um, everybody knows that press, that press is, that press has probably started more big shops than any other press ever made in history. Like everyone has started on that Riley 250, it seems like. And it's a great press. It's super awesome, but it had a lot of flaws that I saw. You know, I come from a, such a technical background with, you know, engineering and technology behind riding motorcycles and everything else. I could just see all the stuff where it, this could make something more difficult for somebody, especially if they're starting off. So we took, you know, things like the registration gate. That was the old nylon bolt situation that had forever that I've seen. I've run a, a very large Facebook group. It's around 13,000 people. And it's pretty much nonstop of the people that are brand new to the, the print industry that have that press. They're like, why am I losing registration? It's because, oh, well, those bolts wear out. You have to continuously, you know, keep up with uh, the maintenance on those things, tighten them up, make sure that's a thing. And I was like, man, this we can we got to fix this. We got to make a solid registration gate that's not going to do that to people, especially until they, you know, they learn. I mean, this is, it's a solid block registration system, like their bigger press. I beat the crap out of one of those when I was manual printing and they, they don't budge. They, they hold registration. They're great. So we swap that out, put that thing on there and then just start upgrading little things here and there, little usability things like putting wheels with solid feet on there so you can move it around, but still have a solid uh, stand to print on at the same time. Like all those little, little touches really made that thing amazing and made it super, super good for people working in, you know, bedrooms, garages, small spaces, uh, typically the people that buy this press. Talking a little bit about your history, you just mentioned you got some engineering background. You obviously have some writing background. What what brought you to the world of screen printing? I mean, why screen printing? Why apparel decoration? That's a, kind of a cool story almost. Like it was just kind of by, it was almost by accident, almost by like luck. It was, it was weird. I originally started off with, um, I was doing YouTube videos on, um, I was doing like Harley scent stuff because at the time that was really kind of blowing up. And uh, it was a new thing that was out. And so I was like, man, I can do that. That's easy compared to what I used to do. Because I was working a normal job for a couple of years. And I was like, this sucks. After I retired from riding for a living, I just, I was a cable guy for a while. I was a motorcycle mechanic for a while and all this other stuff. And I was just like, man, I just, I just can't get down with this. I'm used to having freedom and doing what I want and being the boss. I can't listen to somebody else all day. So I decided I'm going to do this. I'm going to put it on YouTube and, you know, see if it works or whatever, which I've dumped everything I had into that and it it gained a decent little following is around like 20,000 subscribers on YouTube, but I was putting out way more than it was coming back in. Mm -hmm. So eventually I got to the point where I was like, I was broke and almost losing everything I had. I literally was about two weeks away from having to pack up and move back in with my mom at 31 years old. And I was like, shit, I do not want that to happen. <laughs> so I was like, what can I do right now to rectify this situation? And I was just like, the only thing that popped into my head was with my background of riding for a living and working with sponsors and clothing companies and things like that. I was like, maybe I'll start a little clothing brand or something. Maybe I'll try and sell merch to these people that are watching because the YouTube money's not coming in, but like mm -hmm. maybe the people watching will actually support what I do. So I made the little clothing brand called 38 Ride Company. I took the last like couple hundred bucks I had to my name. I convinced the bank to give me a credit card for five grand. I maxed it out in one day with a bunch of clothing and stuff. Everyone told me you're an idiot. That's the stupidest thing you could ever do. And uh, I was just like, I don't know, man, I got to take a gamble. Luckily it worked like within day one of the brand launching, I sold out of every piece of inventory I had that first day. So I wow. started doubling down. It was growing at a pretty quick rate. But the one thing that was a very, very apparent problem was the print quality was terrible. It was garbage. I was dealing with probably like four or five different local shops in town and just nothing but bad experiences, garbage quality, um, you know, bad customer service, missed deadlines, basically all the worst things a shop can do. I experienced. And I was just like, there's gotta be a better way at this point. Like, mm -hmm. I guess mm -hmm. I got to figure out how to do this myself. And so I just said, you know what, I'm going to take whatever little money I have. I'm going to buy it some sort of piece of equipment and I'm going to start from ground zero and get into this. You know, I was still dumping every bit of money I had back into the clothing company. So I didn't really have much to spend. And I was still, I was trying to pay my bills and stuff too. So I had like a spare, like thousand bucks. I bought a stalls hat heat press to start off with. And I started getting yep. heat applied patches from a dude and I started making hats in the basement. I started making my own hats for my brand. So I, immediately my margin was better. Uh, but then I started making hats for other people and things like that. And eventually it grew to, you know, a bigger, a bigger heat press and then a vinyl cutter. And I just had this little arsenal of stuff. I was operating out of like a little, you know, like seven foot by seven foot bedroom, um, <laughs> just sweating in there all day, trying to, trying to make stuff. And then finally, like I just worked my ass off for, I don't even know, like six or eight months, saved up a bunch of money. And I just, 
I said, you know, I'm going all in. I'm not going to, you know, start in a small, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it right. Cause I know you can't make good stuff with half-assed equipment. Mm-hmm. Just, it's just not possible. There's some people that can, but I just knew that I want to make this as easy as possible for me. Cause I'm gonna have a lot to learn. I don't think I'm going to come into this, you know, just swinging for the fences and going to be awesome at it. I know I'm going to suck. So I just dumped, a, it was a ridiculous amount of money. I went to around it, spent, you know, well, well into the five figures and put a professional shop in my basement of my house. I didn't just get a little starter press, little things here and there. I, yep. I got everything. I was a full pro manual shop and never touched a squeegee in my life. <laughs> and uh, I was just like, all right, now I have no choice. We got to do this. <laughs> and uh, I buckled down and learned real, real quick that this is not an easy thing to do. Yeah, I decided at the same time, you know what, I'm going to put this on YouTube and see if people are interested in this. And sure enough, people were in a big, big way. And it took off fast. And it led to, you know, where I'm at now. Okay. What, what, I mean, thinking about that YouTube thing, I mean, when you first kind of got on there and were sharing, was it like how-tos that you were sharing? Was it like just sharing your experience? Like as building a business the ground up? No. And that's one thing, like I, I myself, I will not do a how-to video tutorial video unless I'm 100% yeah. sure I know what I'm talking about because I can't stand clicking on a video. <laughs> and then that person like has no idea what the hell they're talking about. So I just, I figured if I'm going to do this, I'm going to just document my journey and see how that goes. So I just started doing vlogs. The first one was literally the truck pulling up with all that equipment in it and me figuring out how to get into my basement, putting it all together. One thing that made me really stand out was the fact that my home shop wasn't really a home shop like it was, was my basement, but I tore that basement down to the studs. And like, I made that thing look like a professional, crazy commercial shop. It looked mm-hmm. amazing in there. It's still to this day, I have not seen a home shop to that caliber. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what made my stuff stand out so much because people are like, holy shit, this shop is crazy. This guy's not messing around. And that's what was going on in my head when I was doing it. I was like, if I'm going to show this to the world or whatever, or even 10 people have decided to watch it, whoever it is. I want to make sure I project an image of, you know, professionalism and something that shows that like I care about what I'm doing here. So that's what I did. And of course it, it made us look be- bigger or better than we actually were, which was kind of sweet. So like start <laughs> off with just me and my friend, Dan, two designs for me and stuff. We we're just kind of hanging out in that basement, making shit all day. It projected an image of something else. And we, we looked like a bigger company than we were. So we started getting clients really, really quick. And of course, YouTube really fed into that as well. How many followers do y'all currently have on YouTube? I mean, has, has that, did you, do you think like that's the one that's you've really exploded on that platform? Yeah, that's the one that I'm the biggest on by far. Um, I have like okay. 116,000 subscribers, something like that uh, at this point. Um, I've, it's kind of tapered off in the last year or so because of I'm in a new shop now. I went auto, um, doing that whole thing. And our, my business grew a stupid amount. Like we're talking like 500, 600% spike in a very wow. short amount of time. And I'm still trying to figure out how to operate all this stuff. So I'm just like, I'm just barely treading water every day right now, <laughs> just scrambling. trying. To, <laughs> so I haven't had time to really, really make videos for the past while. I've yeah. kind of made a few here and there, but it's not as consistent as I used to be. Things are finally starting to get to where they need to be now. I've been hiring more people and things like that. And I'm just you know, training people up to the point where I can get back to what I want to do. And that's making more videos and helping people in the print industry. That's my main goal. I love that. I think that's so important in this industry specifically. And something that I've really noticed, like, I, I really feel like apparel decorators are here for each other. They they support, you know, their, their fellow decorator. They're, they're willing to share um, what's worked, what's not. You said you just moved to, you recently moved to auto. So when, when did that transition take place and what that kind of look like? It was about last year. I I bought a new property. I didn't want to give up the, uh, I didn't want to give up the home shop aspect because I love working where I live. It's awesome. So I bought a new property um, that has a big shop on the property. I got five acres here and uh, it had like a, you know, it's not huge. It's like a 1300 square foot shop, but compared to what I was in, it's massive. So I was able to get an auto in there, you know, embroidery machine, a bunch of other stuff. And the shop grew to, you know, three times the size that it was. And there was a lot of growing pains in that one. I, Mm -hmm. (laughs) a lot of growing pains in it, but uh, now that I'm kind of through that and things are, they're, they're growing in a, in a way that I can't even comprehend currently. Yeah. Growth is something we talk about a lot because I, I heard, I've i heard horror stories about shops that have kind of gone through what you're going through and they grew too fast. They couldn't keep up, ended up closing shop. So if you could like, you're, you're still yeah. in the process, I feel like, but if there's one piece of advice you could share, one thing that you feel like you've learned thus far on your journey, what, what would that be? Hire as fast as you can. That is... Okay. One thing that I've had to get over because I'm I'm a major perfectionist. Anyone who's ever watched my YouTube channel knows that I am like a crazy person when it comes to that stuff. If there's even just like one little thing out of place, it's it's in the garbage. I don't care. And it's I've had a very hard time letting go of things. 
and getting, letting, you know, people come into the shop, new people that, you know, aren't familiar with the stuff, me having to train them, uh, me having to watch them make mistakes, things like that. And just have to sit there and like, Oh, just <laughs> keep it together. Keep it to yourself. <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. I'm starting to kind of get used to it and it's, mm-hmm. it's getting easier, but yeah, just uh, everything kind of changed for me when I decided to finally let go of that stuff. Cause I was trying to do everything myself for too long. Yeah. And it's just, I can't do it. I'm and now into the point, you know, there's, There's four people here now and that's not enough. I still feel like I'm doing way too much stuff. I need more. I need, I need to get away from this already. So yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy how fast it happened, you know, within a year from me by myself to four people and uh, yeah, we'll be at five. I I literally just put out an ad yesterday. So we'll be at five, hopefully right away. Right. How how did you know you were ready to make that transition and that leap for that, that big growth? I didn't. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I didn't. It, this, it was another like Hail Mary move again, just like the first one. When I started thinking about it, I was just like, you know what? Every time I've sat there and just gone, you know what? Fuck it. I'm just going to go for it. Yeah. Every time I've done that, it's it's worked out. I mean, my riding career, you know, when I'm looking at like, you know, big 200 foot jump or something like that, you have to make that decision because there's no, there's no halfway doing it. So I just always kind of revert back to that. So when I get in that spot where I'm like, I don't know if this is going to work or I start doubting something, I just like, do it. And uh, every time I've done that, it's, it's worked out because it kind of like forces you to do stuff. Right. So like when you're, when you just jump in head first and like, you know, things might not be perfect or whatever, or set up the right way or whatever it is, it forces you to work your ass off and make it right. And that's, that's kind of the way I like to operate. Honestly, you know, the shop before when it was fully manual, I could not physically print as much work as was coming in. I was turning out of every job that came in, I was turning down about eight or nine which wow. was ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> so I was just like, you know what, I got to do this. And, you know, thankfully I have a, a strong partnership with Ryan at the YouTube thing and everything else. And they got really behind me on that. And they're like, you know, the story is, it's really cool so far. Maybe we can get to the next step where you go auto and continue telling that story. And they really supported me in that. Yeah. It's, it's changed everything for me. That's for sure. Yeah. No, I mean, it sounds like your writing career has really influenced this piece of your life quite a bit. It does. It influences honestly, like every part of my life personally. It's, it's kind of weird. It's, it's one of those things where, like I said, you can't, you can't half-ass things. You have to do it or you don't. Or if you start getting in your own head, you get hurt or worse, whatever, whatever that did to me inside my head, it just, it, it flows into every other aspect of my life. And uh, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm really grateful for that because it's worked out very well for me so far. <laughs> I know it sounds like it. I mean, it's, this is a cool story. Um, So let me ask you this. Are you, are you still printing your, your own like retail brand? Is that like still alive and well, or I actually have two of them. Transcript. I've kind of <laughs> put them both on the back burner currently, just because the shop, oh. like I was originally going to kind of focus on those more this year. Uh, because I was like, you know, we got a good enough amount of clients or whatever. I can turn out those jobs real fast. Cause I got the auto and now, uh, I'll have more time to put into this. And that was my initial thought for about two months. And then all of a sudden mm-hmm. the clients on the print shop side went from, you know, this number to about four or five times the number it used to be. Mm-hmm. And now, it's back to me just like I, <laughs> I I literally print all day, every day from, you know, 8 a.m. to 8, 9 p.m. at night every single day. It's to the point now where I need more people. We're probably going to have to get a second auto in here right away. It's bananas. So <laughs> I just, like I said, you got to hire. And I think that's that's my next move, just getting more and more people in here to the point where I can kind of get someone trained up to where they're running production. Because that's, that's going to be the hardest thing for me to let go is a screen printing yeah. side. Because that's where I'm like very, very particular about things. And it's going to take me a long time to get someone to that level. Uh, but eventually I will be able to. And then that's when I can get back to all those little things, and, you know, little fun projects for myself and just be a business owner rather than a guy working in my business. There, there's a massive distinction. I, I catch shit from people all the time of like, you know, you're working in your business, you're not working on your business. Like, yeah, well, you don't understand. I can't just put a person on that press and tell them to print some shirts. It's just not the way it works. You know, you got, they got to know what they're doing. It's, it's very difficult. It's not easy, especially with something like an auto. We're running, you know, four or 500, 600 pieces an hour. You can mess up a lot of stuff in a short amount of time. And, you know, it's on me to cover that. So I don't want to have those mistakes. I don't want to have someone who's not ready to do that yet, have yeah. that mistake land on them because they're going to feel like shit. I mean, I'm taking it slow and that's kind of how, how I've done it here and there, like I've always done these like crazy moves where I just like dive head first into something. But then at the same time, I know when to back it down and to just like ride it out for a little while. So that was what it was like for me before I hired. I was just, I did so much stuff on my own for such a long time because I knew I wasn't ready to be a boss yet. And I knew that I wasn't ready to train someone to do this yet because I was still learning myself. So I was just like, you know what? I'll just wait it out a while. I could have, I could have been automated in a bigger shop within six months of starting to print. And I waited about a year and a half just because I wanted to make sure I was ready. Another huge 
I think reason why some people do grow too quickly is because, yeah, maybe that inability to decipher between the two, to distinguish it, whatever you want to call it, right? I mean, sometimes it's hard to recognize like, yeah, I might ha- be turning down eight or nine orders, but am I ready to take on those eight or nine yeah. orders? Am I ready to hire somebody? Am I ready to teach somebody to train? You know, yeah. I mean, that's huge. Oh, I know. That's, that's what it's like for me with YouTube all the time. People will ask me, you know, I want a tutorial on this, I want a tutorial on that. And I'm- you know, a lot of the stuff I do know, but then uh, something will come up where I'm like, not exactly 100%. I don't know. But like, no, I'm, I'm gonna wait for that. Because even though I know I could put this video out, get a bunch of views, get some sponsors on it, you know, make money off of it. I don't want to do that. I want to make sure I'm ready to teach this to someone so that they're learning the right way. Um, tell me a little bit about Rogue Lab then as it operates. Now. I mean, what do y'all specialize in? What What is your customer base look like? It's wild. Like we do not have a niche whatsoever. That's, yeah. that's what's crazy. Like a lot of shops, you know, operate within a niche. We yeah. do not. It's so weird. We do a lot of design work as well. So we do graphic design, uh, screen printing, embroidery, uh, vinyl stickers, all that type of stuff. Uh, the odd vehicle wrap, laser engraving. We do a lot of stuff. It expanded wow. into a lot of things in the past year or so. And yeah, we, it's super weird. We will go from working with like a very, very high end expensive corporate client one day to printing like crazy death metal stuff the next day to like (laughs) weird, you know, hippie stuff another day to printing stuff for, what can I say about exotic dancers? I'll call them. (laughs) (laughs) It's so crazy. Like our client base is just like every aspect of life you could ever imagine. And that's what keeps it fun. Honestly, like I would not want to be a shop where I'm printing just corporate crap all day long. That's so boring. You know, obviously (laughs) we have to do that stuff that pays the bills and whatever. That's cool. But I want to print those crazy, you know, like eight, nine color simulated process jobs for 50 death metal shirts for a band that 10 people are going to go see because it's awesome. That's what I like to do. Um, so changes every day. And that's what keeps me wanting to work in the shop. Honestly. I love that. What, what would you say your average order size is? I mean, is, is, are you generally kind of in that small, I, for lack of a better way of describing it, are you generally in the print on demand space? No, we would, our typical like minimum, our minimum is lower. Our minimum is like 25 pieces or whatever, but, uh, okay. our, the yeah. lowest order we typically get is 50 or more. Okay. Um, that's kind of where we start at. And then we kind of, on average, I would say, you know, three, 400 piece orders is like the day to day type of thing. Um, and then sometimes you get in, you know, the big ones like that. Uh, but we are working on some new stuff right now. I can't really talk about yet, which is, you know, we're going to be hopefully doing some professional sports teams soon, um, which is pretty crazy. So obviously those orders are going to be well into the thousands or tens of thousands. So that's going to be a a game changer if we land that whole thing, which will, again, I'm going to have to figure out because I've never done something on that scale before. So (laughs) it's Uh going to be interesting. You mentioned vehicle wraps, laser engraving. Do you do all that in-house or do you kind of split? We do it. Wow. Yeah, we do everything in-house. One thing I will not do is sub anything out to anybody. I do not trust a single person to touch something that has my name on it. (laughs) because of just because of the experiences I've had yeah, over the years yeah. with other printers making things for me. I just, mm-hmm. I can't, I can't do it. It just, it doesn't wow. feel good. I just like this. Someone's, you know, embroidery work isn't up to standard and I send it out to their shop and they send it out to my client and whatever, then I'm the one that has to hear about it. Or just, you know, if I, again, just me being very particular, the customer might be happy with it. And then I might see that piece of embroidery or whatever it is and be like, oh, you know, that looks like shit. Um, yeah, yeah. I want, I want total control over what's being made by us. So yeah, we don't sub literally a single thing out here, which is great. Wow. Yeah. No wonder you need to hire people too. I mean, geez, running all of that different equipment. I mean, I have some background in the laser engraving space as well as the vehicle wrap space. And yeah, each one carries its own little nuances that you have to learn and train on and be able to do well. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. I've had to like, I've had to throw myself into the fire so many times to learn this stuff to where I've been in it now, I don't know, five years or something like that. But I, the amount of time that I spend working every day, because even though, you know, most people go to their shop, do their work, they go home and whatever. That is not what I do. Mm-hmm. Like this, even though it's my job, this is literally what I, my passion this is what I love to do. So even though the work day ends at five o'clock, I'm still going every single day. I'm going Saturday, Sunday, whatever. I'm just, I love to do this stuff. I want to learn. And I've, I can't even quantify how much experience I've gained in that five year time. But like, I feel like I've probably got like 10, 15 years of experience in reality, just for the amount of time I've put in so far. Where's your favorite place to go to learn stuff? I mean, where are you getting your training and education? Um, I've kind of, most of it was from YouTube at the very beginning. From there forward, once I got past that kind of beginner stage, I've just been on my own and Mm -hmm. trial and error has been really everything for me. But before I learned how to screen print, I was watching the Ryanet channel religiously every day, uh, learning from Ryan 
you know, yeah. those old videos. Hey, I'm Ryan from Ryan. And <laughs> you know, every day sitting there eating yep. my cereal in the morning, watching a video of that guy is teaching me something. And just kind of, it got me my footing underneath me. So once it came time to get my, my first piece of equipment, I was able to kind of obviously not just do it right out of the gate, but I had enough of the theory down to where I wasn't making crazy mistakes here and there. Like I was making mistakes, obviously, but I was definitely not making the typical beginner mistakes for sure. I was definitely past a few of those and then got going a little bit faster. And yeah, I just, for probably six months straight, every single day, I watched him do some sort of screen printing video. And then uh, once I got past that point, yeah, it was just you know, trial and error, things like that. I'm um, talking to other shop owners, people with more mm-hmm. experience and whatever. But for the most part, for me, it's it's trial and error. I like to figure things out on my own because like I said, I am very particular and a perfectionist and I don't like to learn things. If, you know, if I, if somebody else is teaching me something or talking about something, I want to see their work first because, mm-hmm. you know, if, if their work isn't up to what I think is what it should be, I don't want to listen to what they have to say. So I'm going to figure out for myself instead. That's the way I've always kind of gone. It's working out not too bad. You know, I make a lot of mistakes that cost me some money sometimes, but honestly, making mistakes is the fastest way to learn. It, it seems like you're doing just fine going from not knowing how to pull a squeegee to having a press named after you. I'd say things are <laughs> yeah. not just fine. Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. I got no complaints. <laughs> I got one more hot seat question for you. And I always like to ask this one because I get just such a weird, random variety of responses to it. What's your favorite part about being in the uh, decorated apparel industry? For me, it's a challenge. Ah. It's the challenge of doing something new every single day. Mm -hmm. That is my favorite thing ever. Like I said, we do so much different stuff um, and deal with so many different kinds of artwork, so many different types of clients. My, My day is never, ever the same. And me with my crazy ADHD brain, that's what makes me, you know, thrive in this because (laughs) there's never a day where I don't feel like going to work. Every day when I wake up, I'm like, oh yes, what do I got to do today? And then things just start coming at me at hundred miles an hour and I have to solve all these problems. And it's, it's the most fun thing ever. I I think, yeah, like you said, it's, it's the riding thing, the competitive nature of it too. You know, I'm, I'm in competition with myself all day and that's the best kind of competition to be in. Absolutely. Better to pay attention to what's going on in your shop, what you can do better focus on yourself, your goals, what you want to do. I love it. Absolutely. Yeah. Being, being competitive in this industry is very, a very big edge. And that doesn't have to be like, you know, a sales thing or keeping hoarding information, whatever, just being competitive with like, I want to be the best at this or be the best at that. I will freaking dunk on a three-year-old. I will not let anybody beat me (laughs) at anything. (laughs) No mercy. ruthless. I don't care. So that's uh, having that aspect is, is really good. And that's yeah. Well, I'm going to laugh about the dunking on the three-year-olds for a, <laughs> many, many days from now. I'm sure I'll still be laughing about that. <laughs> All right, Lee, where can people <laughs> find you? Where can they connect with you? Give us some contact info. You can find me Instagram, all the, well, any social media platform. It's Lee Stewart 38. Um, you'll find me there and you can find my shop Rogue Lab MFG on every single social media platform as well. YouTube, all that stuff. I'm pretty easy to find. Awesome. Well, thanks Lee so much for joining us. Um, I can't wait to hear about all these little future endeavors that you're teasing. I'm sure, uh, you will let everybody know all of your awesome YouTube followers, everybody. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thank you for having me.